Hello and welcome to online worship with Epiphany Lutheran Church in Richmond, Virginia. My name is Joseph Bullock and I'm one of the pastors for Epiphany along with Philip Martin. Today is a worship service for February the 28th and it is the second Sunday of Lent when we hear about God's mission seen most clearly in the cross of Jesus. There is a uh, bulletin that you can download from our website at epiphanyelca.org, but everything that you need to worship this morning will be on the screen right in front of you. In the life of our congregation, there are a couple of exciting opportunities for young people today. First and second graders have their second uh, session about the Lord's Prayer uh, that meets today at noon over Zoom, and 5th through 12th graders meet for their second Bible study over Zoom using We Are a New Creation, the devotions that our young people and their adult leaders created together. Our Lenten Wednesday worship services continue this coming week as we look uh, at stories of healing. Um, this week we will look at the story of Jesus healing the Gerasene demoniac and think about what that might mean for God's healing in our life today. That worship service will premiere at 7 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube, so we hope that you will join us this Wednesday. Uh, this uh, coming March the 7th, just right here pretty soon now, is Sonia Fluckiger's 100th birthday. Sonia is the oldest member of our congregation, and we have a goal to flood her mailbox with cards and notes and signs of love during this time. So um, even if you don't know Sonia, you can look up her um, address in our directory and send her a card and wish her a happy birthday. Um, Joan Reynolds, beloved member of our congregation for over 40 years uh, and a blessing to our congregation in so many ways, uh, died a week ago uh, last Sunday. Her family will gather today for a private funeral, and uh, the family wishes to say to all of you that uh, we wish that everyone could gather to give God thanks for Joan, but during these times that will not be possible. The family does appreciate every prayer and every sign of encouragement during this time, so we pray today for Joan's family as they gather. Finally, our mystery hymn word for today means to happen or to befall. So when you're worshiping and singing, if you come across a word that you think means to happen or to befall, we invite you to put it in the comment section below. We continue with worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws close to us in Jesus Christ. Let us return then to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out, out your mercy, mercy over us. us. Our, Our sin, sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the Spirit, to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven. God remembers them no more. So journey on the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in all of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. Praise in the great assembly. 
I will pre perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord. God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. The second reading is from <clears throat> Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let your steadfast love The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. 
For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, boys and girls. It's time for the children's sermon, so I invite you to get closer to your screen if you need to. Uh, And as we do that, we'll sing our children's sermon song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You know, I know it's time for the children's sermon. I know that's what I'm supposed to do right now, but I really don't feel like doing it. I always feel a little awkward doing the children's sermon. It's really hard. So I think, you know, I've been wanting to read my new book. So I think instead of the children's sermon right now, I'm just going to read for a little while. Hmm. Oh, you're still there? I guess that's probably not a good idea to read when I'm supposed to do the children's sermon. But I really don't like to do a children's sermon right now. I don't feel like doing it, and I don't really know what I feel like saying. So, you know, I need, I was, I need to do some coloring uh, for one of, one of my projects. So I think I'm just going to, instead of doing a children's sermon... I'm going to color for a little while. That's a brown crayon. Maybe I can get a better crayon than brown. Um, there. This one's called Sky Blues. I'm just going to say the children's sermon. I'll just, just kind of sit there. You know, I know I'm probably not supposed to be coloring when I'm supposed to be doing the children's sermon. But I really don't feel like doing a children's sermon today. You know, I need to practice my guitar because there's a new song I've been trying to learn. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to practice my guitar and not worry about the children's sermon right now. <laughs> Uh, but what are you doing? What, Pastor Joseph? Um, I'm just playing my guitar right now. Right, but uh, what are you supposed to be doing right now? I'm supposed to be doing the children's sermon right now, but I really don't feel like doing it. I'm a little scared of it. I'm a little awkward and nervous. Don't you think we need a children's sermon? Yeah, we probably need a children's sermon. Don't you think we probably can't go on to the rest of the worship service until we do the children's sermon? We probably can't go on to the rest of the service until I do the children's sermon. Yeah. You're right. Okay. Have you ever had to do something that you really don't want to do that you think is going to be really hard? You probably have. Well, that is what we know happens to Jesus. He tells his best friends that he's going to have to do something that's not really fun, that doesn't sound like it's going to be a good time. He tells his friends that he's going to go in to Jerusalem and he's going to suffer. He's not going to go have a big party. He's going to, have, he's going to suffer. They're going to make fun of him. And eventually... He's going to give his life on the cross. We know Jesus doesn't really look forward to doing it. 
And his friends especially don't want him to do it. They want him to go do something else, anything else other than die on the cross. But Jesus knows that's what he's supposed to do. That's his job. And so he does. Jesus does it. And he knows that we can't know really what God's love is like. And we won't know what God's life is like forever and ever until he does what he's supposed to do and goes and suffers and dies for us on the cross. And what happens after that is he rises from the dead and he comes back and lives forever and and invites you and me to join with him. Sometimes that means, even though we follow Jesus, we're going to have to do some, some good things that are hard. They're hard to do. But God will always be with us and will always give us Jesus as an example that he loves us and is always with us and that something good will always come even when we do hard things. So can you remember that for me? And next time, um, help me do a better children's sermon. God bless you. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the cross of Jesus. Help us follow him even when it is hard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may return to your seats. The breeze on Mars sounds remarkably similar to the breeze on Earth. But still, hearing it for the first time and knowing what I was hearing made me kind of shudder. If you haven't heard it yet, it really is something worth checking out. The sound of Martian wind was captured by the onboard microphones of the Perseverance rover which NASA launched this past summer and which landed on the crust of the fourth stone from the sun this past week. The rover sent back sounds of the wind of Mars blowing, as well as video of the vehicle's own entry and descent, the deployment of its parachutes, and its safe landing on the red planet. 
David Gruel, speaking for NASA's Propulsion Lab, said that expectations, actually, of the audio and visual were pretty low. Almost like he had been watching Daniel Tiger with his kids, he said about it, we get what we get and we won't get upset. But all went much better than planned and all the information that we received this past week was among the most spectacular in the history of space exploration. NASA's mission hopes to answer key questions about the potential for life on other worlds. Were there habitable conditions on Mars in the past? Are there signs of microbial life that are still present? Are there possibilities for producing oxygen from the atmosphere on Mars that would make the future of humans going to Mars more possible? All these questions may be answered from the findings and footage of the Perseverance mission, but already the images and the sounds that NASA has collected have brought our understanding of the planet Mars into sharper focus. Jesus, in our gospel text today, brings God's mission into sharper focus as he begins to teach us that he must suffer, be rejected, be killed, and be raised. His Galilean ministry has brought him and his followers to the distant locale of Caesarea Philippi, almost like another planet in terms of its difference in culture to Israel. It was a place outside of Israel's orbit where the large part of society was devoted to a god called Pan and various other cults. But it's here, specifically, that Jesus asks his disciples who they say he is. And Peter, having reflected on all that Jesus has said, is do said and done, his healing and miracle working along the way, Peter has come to understand that Jesus is the one for whom all Israel has waited. And so he confesses, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And it's clear from that uh, verbal affirmation of faith, that's declaration of his feelings, that Peter's expectations are really high. He probably supposed that everything was just going to keep going as it had been. There'd just be more healings and miracles. Jesus would fill the vacant throne of David, crush the powers of the gods all around them, and restore God's kingdom to glory and power as had been promised. But all is not going to go as planned for Peter and the others. Because Jesus is a Messiah who will suffer and will die. And he will be raised, yes. But my guess is that Peter, hearing about the suffering and dying, never even heard about that last part. None of us like to have to suffer. And so it might be that we can relate to Peter's knee-jerk reaction to change Jesus' mind. But Jesus is obedient to God and to God's mission, no matter who that sets him in opposition to, whether it's the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders, or even his own disciples. Maybe from where we sit, Peter's desire to tell Jesus what to do is laughable, because he's the Messiah after all, or pitiable. But I think that it's also all too familiar for us who would like to tell God how to act in our lives, to tell God how to lead us, what we would have God do for us, and to spare us suffering for glory. How often have we thought and prayed, Oh God, won't you make everything right for us and won't you make it easy for us as well? But Jesus won't be patronized and he won't be told what to do. And so he responds to this idea by saying, Get behind me, Satan. Contrary to Peter's desire and at times our desire to control God and to have God bless the path we've already chosen, Jesus shows that in fact he will be the leader. I do wonder what Peter really wanted. Did Peter want to save Jesus from suffering and humiliation? Perhaps did he want to save himself from suffering and humiliation as one of Jesus' followers? Whatever it was, Jesus calls it a satanic idea, a contorted, wrong-spirited, directionless hope. And Jesus demands that all who would become his disciples get behind his mission 
and let God set the course. Jesus has not come to be our own private God, to do just whatever we would have God do. But he has come to do God's will, and we are to follow him. At our last ELCA National Gathering for High School Youth in Texas, we took a large group, and there were so many tens of thousands of people of there, we always had to be aware. There was always a danger of being pushed by the forces of the crowds um, to get lost. And so, Silas Parker, one of our youth at the time, who's now in college, in Houston carried a flag on a long pole up ahead of us. And that flag was emblazoned with the cross. That cross helped us to find our way and to stay together and to keep from being lost. We had to keep our eyes on the cross and we had to stay behind that cross that it was leading our way. We are people who follow the man of the cross. And we become, therefore, a people of the cross. To be people of the cross means denying ourselves, looking to God, and following Jesus. We are called to suffer for others and to voluntarily endure pain for the sake of others and for the sake of the world that God loves. That does not mean as is sometimes said in popular culture, that we all have a cross to bear in the form of suffering that God condones or passes out. It does not mean that any kind of abuse, domestic abuse or self-loathing or self-harm or the scourge of disease and sickness, that these are things that God lays upon us. God does not cause suffering. Rather, In the cross, we see that God is with us in our suffering and has acted in a mission to journey to the depths of suffering, despair, loneliness, and death to free us from its power and in our freedom to make us a part of that mission to extend freedom and love and health to others. I actually read one super interesting article this week that said at NASA, in preparation for their mission to Mars, like in the early stages of their planning, they extended an invitation to anybody who wanted to participate that you could send your name to them and they would place your name on a microchip that they would include inside the Perseverance rover. In response to that invitation, 10,932,295 people sent in their names. So nearly 11 million people's names are literally on Mars right now. They're literally a part of the mission. And as part of that, they actually receive special emails or communications of some kind that talk about updates on what's going on in that mission. In baptism, our name is taken up into the mission of God. We are claimed by a watery cross in God's unconditional free gift of love, and we are actually literally a part of God's mission. Through God's word, we receive updates on God's activities in our lives and in the world. We are connected to Jesus' mission of love, and we are invited to take up the cross each day. That means we're invited by God's grace to see other people enduring suffering and to choose to enter into their pain, to be with them as Jesus Christ has done for us. What does it look like? Carrying the cross looks like a high school student sitting down at a lunch table to eat with a person who's been outcast by their peers and to be their friend. Carrying the cross looks like just taking time to listen to a person who is in crisis. Carrying the cross looks like forgiving the person with whom um, you are estranged. Carrying the cross looks like choosing to use your resources to help alleviate the crisis that somebody else is experiencing. Carrying the cross looks like making your voice heard on behalf of those who are marginalized by virtue of their race, their nationality, who they choose to love, or the choices that they have made. For most of our lives, all around us, we hear the message that our life belongs to us, that we can shape it and make it into what we want it to be. Celebrities and influencers build up their own name and their own brand. Amazon's most popular titles are self-help books that promise 
that you can unlock your authentic self. Jesus says that the meaning of life is to give it away. His paradoxical way is an invitation to find the answer to the key questions of life, not by plumbing ourselves for the answers, but to find them by learning who Jesus is and by emulating Him in reaching out to others. Perhaps, by God's grace, in those moments when we reach out to others, we will be able to alleviate their suffering. Sometimes, we won't be successful. But the calling is to open ourselves to God's desire for our life. And we're invited to find our fulfillment in Jesus' way of self-denial. And that might mean that our life has to change. To those of us who are overly comfortable in life, we might be called out of our comfort. To those of us who've made politics and power over others into our central hope, we may be called to look again to the power of God which is revealed in weakness. To those of us who suffer and who feel alone in a cloud of depression or despair, we are called to see and believe that in Jesus Christ, God has acted to bring even those who are bowed down in the earth to praise God, to stand in awe of the Lord, and to proclaim God's deliverance. How ironic that Peter wants to pull Jesus aside and keep him from his mission, because it is a mission that is undertaken out of love for Peter and for his friends and for all God's people. But Peter wants to hide Jesus away. Pull him aside. But the way of the cross is not to hide our faith. Our relationship with God is personal, but it is not private. It is public. And to follow Jesus means to risk scorn and suffering on account of him. When I visited my sister Sarah in Bet Sahur, Palestine, when she lived there a few years ago, when she was doing young adults for global mission with the ELCA, I met the Palestinian Christians who were serving as her host family, George and Shadia and their children. This family gave my sister a room to live in. They fed her from their table. They, they treated her like a, a daughter, really. And when I visited with them, along with Sarah, my wife, they let us sit at their table and told us of their life and faith. I found out from George and Shadia that in Palestine today, Christians make up about 10% of the population, a vast minority that's somewhat shunned and scorned. Right after this conversation, we got up from the table, we walked out to their front courtyard, and I noticed that George and Shaddy had an iron gate around their property, as do most families in that town, but on the top of their gate, there was an iron cross, big for everyone to see. And I remarked my surprise that he would have that symbol on his home as a minority in a hostile environment. And with confidence, George exclaimed, this is who I am, my friend. Indeed, this is who we are, my friends. We are people of the cross. People who have been claimed and called to be a part of God's mission. To heal, help, save, suffer with, and extend love to God's beloved. We're a people who are a part of God's mission of perseverance through death to life. We're a people who tell the news that God will go anywhere for us, not just up to the heavens, but even down to the bottom of the pit of death. In Jesus, God has plumbed our deepest pain and suffering, and he has gone all the way to the depths of the grave, and he brings life and healing to that very place. He brings life and healing to every crack and crevices of the universe, to every planet, to every galaxy, and to all creation, God can and does bring real life out of real death. And our names and identities are joined to His mission. So take good courage to enter into the suffering of others knowing there is more than potential for life. New life is a promise from God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who was who is and who is to come. Thanks be to God. 
Amen. We are God's people by our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Eternal God, your call to trust you and to follow is often difficult and frightening. But you undergird our faith to do so with the promise of unconditional love. By your great mercy, help us relinquish our desire for glory and instead guide our footsteps in the life-giving ways of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of hope, your promise to Abram and Sarai became the blessing for many people. As our congregation responds to the promises of our life in Jesus, inspire us to be a blessing to those who worship here and those whom we serve even in a digital online presence. Bless the contributions of those who minister with faith formation to the newly baptized, as well as those who tend to our columbarium. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of today and tomorrow, we lose sight of your triumph over evil and suffering when we are surrounded by so much terror and violence. Instill in us a faith that trusts your Son is risen and that one day all people will serve him when all the earth shall bow down to you. We pray especially today for those who are worried about tomorrow, for those in the grips of terrorism or oppressive governments, for those who have lost loved ones in war or domestic crime, for those who see no way out of crippling poverty. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of new beginnings, strengthen our commitment to your mission and to follow with our cross and suffer alongside others. We thank you for our Stephen ministers and their care receivers, for our Timothy ministers and the youth they shepherd. Continue to bless them with listening ears and attentive hearts as they meet and minister virtually. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of all righteousness, you do not ever despise the afflicted, but come to the rescue of all who are in need. Grant patience to any who suffer and compassion to those who are called to care for those who suffer. We pray for Jenica, Carol, Megan, Anne, and the Reynolds family at the death of Joan. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of grace, remember your covenant with us and keep us faithful to you until we join with all the saints, especially Joan Reynolds, around your heavenly throne. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial 
and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God.